Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Garrett Schmidt, and I am the managing editor for VVC Exhibit Hall. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you today to uh, the live webinar that's actually part three of a three-part series hosted by Roji Health Intelligence. And the series is called Three Ways to Transition to an APM. Uh, or three keys rather to uh, transitioning to an APM. And today's final session is titled uh, Clinician Strategy for APM Success. So I'm very excited to hear from our speakers today. A few items of note before we get started. Um, everyone has joined today in listen only mode. So it's kind of like a traditional webinar format where we can't see your camera uh, or hear you. So don't need to worry about muting your microphone or anything uh, like that. Also, during the webinar, we do want to hear you, though. We do want to hear your questions, and we're going to have a time for Q&A toward the end. So at any time, uh, if you have a question, please submit it uh, using um, your, uh, you have a little attendee module there, and there's an area for questions. It's different than the chat, so uh, make sure you ask your questions there. And you, you don't have to wait until the Q&A. Go ahead and ask them at any time. Finally, uh, today's session is being recorded. And so uh, what's going to happen is after we're done, I'm going to send everybody a that's registered a link to the recording as well as to uh, the slides. We don't have a ton of slides, but uh, uh, they'll be there where you can get them and you can uh, contact the team there and you'll be able to uh, to have it all and share it with colleagues, etc. or rewatch it yourself. And we hope that you do. Uh, finally, without further ado, I want to present uh, our speakers today, uh, Dr. Tom Dent, who's the president and CMO of Roji Health Intelligence, and also uh, Terry Hush, who is the CEO and founder of Roji Health Intelligence, and excited to have both of you with us today. So welcome, guys. Thanks so much, Garrett. Uh, let me introduce Tom and myself to you all. Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending part three. Um, I'm not going to repeat a lot of material today from one and two, so you want maybe to go back and, and look at some of the material in the slides through uh, Value-Based Care Exhibit Hall. Um, Tom, let me first introduce Tom Dent, who was trained and practiced as a family medicine physician. He was involved in medical education uh, when I met him, actually, and developed and ran residency programs with a, a clinical practice as a base for training as well. Uh, he started a very large IPA and then moved to um, an academic center system where he developed a PHO in league with the, the hospital network and all the physicians. Uh, and uh, that's where our we met and I joined him. So um, he's got a lot of stories to tell and I'm sure he would love to tell them himself. Tom, do you want to say anything else? Thank you, thank you, Terry. I'm delighted to be here. This is very important as it comes to the role of physicians and what's happening, the transition. It's stressful, we have a lot of pressure on, on these professionals and I think we have to figure how the future can be adapted for them to be successful and to have joy in this. Joy, absolutely. All right, thanks, Tom. Um, for myself, I'm going to lead off today and then Tom will get into the meat of the actual strategies on physician engagement. So we'll talk first a little bit about creating the clinical network. My own background uh, professionally began in policy making and in state government, actually, where I was in charge of the employee benefits program, worked for the governor, I also was um, then became Medicaid director for the state, uh, which taught me a lot. And my goal there was really to increase access, access and equity for constituents in the Medicaid program. And from there, I went to a, a large private payer and then to the academic institution to work with Tom. There, in that capacity, we developed a, an organization that was wholly risk-based between not only the, the physicians, but the institutions 
and we capitated and subcapitated even the specialists. So uh, lots of stories to tell on that one, but I won't go into that kind of detail. We learned a lot in that process about how to, what kinds of things um, mattered to physicians, how we were best getting a message across, what kind of uh, success criteria we needed to develop and so on. So I'm going to go into um, a little bit about that first. First of all, the, this presentation is really geared to people who are considering more of a risk trajectory, whether that's an existing ACO or a specialty care model or private ACO arrangements with health plans and moving into more risk, bundled payments, and those ACOs who are right now planning a transition to population-based payments. What we'll cover today is, first of all, how you establish the network without generating liability, uh, three methods that you can use to build physician trust, developing your care team, and best practices for engagement and innovation in your clinical network. What we do is provide value-based care technology and services to all kinds of provider organizations, whether they're already ACOs or whether they are organizations that are still in fee-for-service and working through MIPS, World Reporting Registry. And what uh, our focus is, is tools that help identify patient outcomes and uh, cost issues going down the track and target health interventions to those groups that most need them so that the process from the end of the provider is very focused and not kind of scattered. We provide our um, clients with the ability to engage physicians in data and also in clinical improvement. So I wanna get um, a definition straight uh, first on what an APM is because a lot of people use APM to think about the actual organization. Well, an APM is the actual payment model that is risk-based and uh, it would include both the specialty care models and ACOs. ACOs, you can be an APM even if you're built on a fee-for-service type of base and yet have incentives on top of that or you can build an APM on a population-based payment model. Most payers and policymakers believe that changing payment models is essential, and I think we fall into that camp uh, for sure, but that it has to be matched with incentives and alignment, alignment internally to the organization so that the, the physicians are rewarded for value as opposed to volume. So developing your APM clinical network, um, there's one thing that I want to touch in particular. It needs to be developed with an eye towards who's participating and who are the referral physicians. Because of the cost attribution methodology, costs are attributed to not just to primary care physicians, but potentially to specialists who are in the ACO. Uh, you can have a patient who didn't see a primary during the year, but went for consultations with a specialist, and that specialist will then be responsible for the entire cost of that patient for the year. So it's really important to make that distinction about participating and referral network in an ACO. And what we see happen in clinical network development is a lot of organizations will start with those physicians who are important to the current enterprise politically or in leadership or so on. But it doesn't create the kind of basis that you need for actually developing a cost-based model in APMs. And it, um, this kind of will create particular challenges for multi-specialty groups because of course, all of the physicians are in uh, the same group and sometimes in the same tax ID number. We actually have suggested to some organizations that they split out the tax ID numbers 
so that the primary and the um, specialty network are distinct and um, we don't ha you don't have any cost attribution issue. The focus for the ACO in the specialty care arena needs to be ensuring the value of the 40 to 60 percent of costs attributed to specialty services. And a lot of people will not really appreciate that number, um, but that's what is driving real costs in a direction. So that, of course, includes the inpatient stays and the procedures and so on that are coming from specialty care. But the, the issue that an ACO has is that it's such a big volume that without getting a handle on that, it's extremely difficult to control the overall costs of the entity. And the more important thing is that those specialty partners need to be involved in the actual data sharing, the cost variation analysis, because they have needs too to be referral networks for other organizations as well. So we advocate the, the creation of specialty partner relationships that do involve data sharing, that do involve creation of episodes so that you can start to dig into the drivers of costs and look at pathway development for how to refer patients to specialists or whether they belong uh, still in the primary care um, mechanism or pathways for patients that opt out patients based on primary care criteria or that reduce at the end of the process, reduce variation in costs and outcomes. On the ACO specialty needs side, um, you really need to map the specialty needs by patient claims and referral area, referral data. That will tell you that where your patients need different specialty services and who they're going to right now. So a lot of organizations, when they start, of course, don't have that historical claims data. But as soon as you get that historical claims data, it's really important to look at that information and determine what your competition is between specialists, who, where your access points are for your um, beneficiaries, and how to go about creating some structure in that referral arrangement need to identify the patient episodes and procedures via episodes so that you can start to bundle the overall costs and create a unit for comparison between each other. And then again, as I mentioned, determine the referral criteria for sending patients between the primaries and the specialists. And then what is the communication channel back to the primary to be able to manage that? Specialty care APMs are another kind of APM model that is totally sitting on the specialty side. It's a great way for specialists to focus on value. And a lot of organizations, especially in orthopedics, have seen uh, the, the possibilities that can come out of developing specialty care APMs so that they can offer those to employers and to private insurers. It works both for government and private payers. It allows uh, specialists to really dig into the data, backing the excellence that they have in the field, and to use those kind of indicators to promote their own services. And it also requires the same tools of primary care focused APM. So you have parity in what specialists are looking at. But along with data, uh, physician engagement is the most critical issue for an APM. And I'm going to turn this over to Tom now, who's going to look a little bit at the physician environment and how that affects engagement. Uh, well, the physicians are bur burned out and disillusioned for sure. Uh, and the highest burn rate, uh, burnout rate ever recorded is 63%. That's a substantial amount. Uh, the biggest issues for a lot of the physicians is that 
layering on of administrative tasks uh, and pressure for the vo volume going at the same time, those, are, those cannot occur if you're looking at value-based care. You cannot be paying that much attention to volume at that stage. You have to look at what the value is going to be. Uh, physicians, both, okay. <laughs> physicians moving to an employed workforce are, are increasing. 74% uh, of physicians are now employed. That has continued to grow up. And a lot of that is, not, is because you have different players in here who are uh, contributing to this. Healthcare giants like Amazon, CVS, Walgreens, they've stated they wanted to be, be very big and they are. Uh, large scale MSO, ASOs and Optum. All of these are coming into the environment and with equity, equity based capital, which is powerful. Uh, they're aggressively buying. Something's jumping here. Uh, physicians' attitudes have changed uh, because of the pandemic, because they were not, volume did not really help them in that circumstance. They wanted a fixed fee for a population. And that actually, those that participated in risk did. Uh, it was with prospective payments. Largest result was the largest single year of physician migration to employment. That that is one of the uh, pieces of the pandemic that has come out. Physician tolerance for risk has gone up because of this. Uh, I think there is always uncertainty about what the element of risk is going to be, but I think with careful planning that can be assuaged. Population-based payments, uh, that is obviously being accepted more by physicians. Uh, moving into corporate medicine or APMs are the, are the business model. Uh, there's higher amount of APMs generally from those already in pay for performance. So that's not surprising. The study that showed the ones that go into this are those tend to be larger and have a lot more resources. Yeah, and I'd like to add on, on this one is that what you're really seeing also is a trade-off between um, if you see the, the green line, which is APMs going up, and the blue line, which is pay for performance going down, that's where most of the, the providers who are moving to APMs are. They are coming from an already existing pay for performance model where there's weaker incentives on uh, fee for service base and moving into an APM. Whereas the straight fee for service with no incentives at all, which still remains um, a big share, is declining uh, now, but still very gradually. Um, what the, one of the other things that we have seen is that if you look at the ACO reach acceptance pool, uh, which may not be the final group, you will see which kind of organization is likely to be pro-population-based payments. So taking apart that, that list of, I think it's now 118 or so, um, many corporate and equity-backed ACO enabler organizations, but also several successful physician-led ACOs, which is a little surprising um, because they're not always very large, but they are successful. And uh, uh, several community-based ACOs like federally qualified health centers who are experienced. So they felt conf confident enough to move into a population-based kind of experiment with global risk. Um, 
But surprisingly, a small, it's a small number, but a few large health system with integrated delivery systems are in the approval list. Now, physicians will look at future expectations, and that's this list, some of those there for the old roles are pretty well established. So you see the patient, treat, refer or not, uh, document and get the patient back in. There are new roles and physicians are gonna look at this and say, wow, I'm, I'm already overwhelmed. What do we do? Uh, but this new roles have to be accompanied by changes in the system. They, there must be education, not only education of the patients and the physicians, but everyone within the team. Uh, and there's going to be increased amount of interpretation for complex things such as genomics. Motivation of patients, hold it. Oh, you want me to go back? Okay. Uh, motivation of patients is going to be critical. I'll come back to that and talk about uh, motivational training. Uh, cost manager, they, they expect that to be something that the physicians would look at because this is their, they're going to be their revenue down the road. Uh, but coordination of the patient care team and participation in shared decision making are all part of this. And uh, clinicians will continue to see the patient and prescribe treatment. Now, the next, the next slide. Patient care teams will be increasingly important as all those other roles uh, I showed there impact. They have to have a team. You can't just put this on the individual physician. And you can't, you have to have more data that's going to be coming in from different sources like the navigators, care coordinators. All of this has to be uh, looked at and included. Uh, <coughs> and data for cost transparency. Uh, this is important so that you understand where it's coming from and why. Uh, the interventions that are here are queued so that we make sure that it's happening in the proper sequence, that that can create costs and cost in themselves. Can you get the next one? There are four basic strategies uh, align compensation uh, with the rewards. We'll talk about each of these, share performance data, involve physicians in decision-making, develop educational and training programs related to the new roles. All of those are basic and necess necessary strategies, and I'll go into each of those. Looking at value, is there the physician is being rewarded for participation in initiatives that it will give value back to the organization. Uh, credits and training for motivational interviewing that can cut down on unnecessary, unwanted uh, interventions. It's important to recognize anti-bias pro programs are most inst big institutions have that smaller organizations may not, but they all should be uh, observed because that can, that can create cost in and of itself. The whole idea of the parking spaces is respect. There has to be trust and respect on both sides. And Okay. Uh, do you foster collaboration among the physicians? Uh, by providing enough time in their schedule and what what other activities that may be educational grand rounds that actually deal with process improvement. Uh, it can't be looking at who made mistakes and what mistakes were yeah, were made. And I think that's going to be something we'll I'll discuss later. Can I get the next? approach to data presentation must be carefully done. And one of the things that we did is we looked at a category called notable observations. It's where something is not what we expect, 
It could be better, it could be worse, but you're presenting the physician with something that is not pejorative. And here we get into, is it lead to investigative or evaluative? And I think that we want to move as much as possible to investigative. Uh, in order to do this, you have to have patient detail, and be able to track this as a story of what's going on. And here again, learning environment is essential in this whole process. Next one. This is a learning environment that is not so good. Uh, it's lecturing, hierarchical, uh, passive. Uh, I don't think physicians are gonna, or other, other members of the team, and here when I say physicians, I mean all members of the team. Uh, not just the physicians, the MPs, the MAs, everybody is part of this and should be included in the educational process and can provide a lot more education back, but they have to be actively engaged. Can I get the next one? Collegial relations are critical. There must be mutual trust yeah, in order to get anything done. And it has to be respectful and active. This can be contentious when we're talking about divvying up money. And I think we're going to have to look at that prospectively. Next one. That's a token there. <laughs> I didn't realize it's sort of an evil looking face. Uh, but physicians must be involved with decision making. It's not where they suddenly learn about major impact to their practice uh, because uh, something that came down from above it has to be clinically focused and the outcome must matter to the patients. That's okay. Motivational interviewing is important because it's a, an approach that engages the, the patients in looking at what they can do to overcome barriers to health issues. These are major issues as we look at uh, episodes of care that uh, are not procedural, but uh, let's say diabetes, things of that sort. You have to have motivational interviewing to get that out. Same with bias. Data literacy is something that we see repeatedly being a problem, and and also it, it can, wears its head with shared decision making, where you are seeking to get uh, feedback on the desires of the patient and their what they're willing to accept. Uh, cost transparency is essential. Patients need to be involved, but again, you have to have a balance here. You don't want them coming in with 50 pages of research on something that uh, is not gonna help anyone. So it has to be directed and it has to be medically appropriate. Terry Nixon. Yeah, I think, um... Tom's talked about the four general strategies that we think are the baseline of what needs to be done and how to do it within APM entities. There's a, a lot of innovation going on around physician engagement right now. And so there are a couple ideas that we wanna put out there for um, investigation. And you can find more of these on our website and the blogs and uh, the latest one on physician engagement will have links to some of the activities related to this. So one is a physician activation program. This is an overarching program that structures physician engagement, rewards them for it, and um, is focused on participation in initiatives, validating data, searching for value, investigative, um, opportunities and so on. And so this is uh, something where physicians actually do get scored, but it's kind of like a points process for participation, not because they're good or bad. 
and uh, it helps to create a little bit of competition and fun around the idea of engagement in the program. Um, another idea that is taking hold in some arenas is called lean management. So lean management is borrowed from industry, not healthcare generally, but it's um, being adapted in healthcare. And lean management means the managers get out of the way or the administrators get out of the way and let the experts really do their jobs and identify innovation. But it's specifically through a process of searching for waste. And uh, in healthcare, there's um, some effort in some quarters to look for this kind of process to be physician led, clinically focused and um, identify where in the process of patient from whatever, whatever processes, um, because there are many, as we all know, whatever processes are resulting in duplication, less than optimal outcomes, have clin clinical and administrative cost ramifications and so on. So it's an area worth exploring. And then a, a third is a redesign project for pathways. One of the things that I thought was interesting in one of the previous slides is that only about 46% of physicians say that they use clinical pathways adopted by their organizations. But we know that clinical pathways are a, a way of systematizing patient care so that the most value can be delivered to the patient. But some of those pathways are really very focused on one kind of uh, specialty. So multidisciplinary pathways is, is what is this is moving into. Cancer was uh, probably the first to look at multiple, multiple disciplines and creation of pathways and multiple objectives to make sure that the care to, delivered to the patient was totally balanced and so on. And um, Engaging clinicians in pathway work is a way of actually using the skills that they have, um, as I would say, up to their license, which is uh, a term borrowed from an orthopedics journal that is discussing various physician engagement uh, strategies and, and why it's so essential to eliminate the busy work out of the physician agenda and focus on where they can add value with their own expertise. So just in, in summary on our collaboration with physicians, we've seen the movement to them, for them to be much less risk averse than health systems are in going into APMs. Or otherwise they wouldn't be going to employers who are have a business model of APMs and have more of them. The outnumber, the, the number of physicians in corporate medicine now outnumber the number of physicians in traditional provider organizations. Many organizations, however, don't bring physicians into the actual APM venture. Uh, they build it for them. They ask them to be participating. They take on the risk, which is um, one of the things that the more recent rules disallowed so that the risk passes down to the physicians also. And really it's doing physicians a disservice not to be part of the venture because it makes them cogs in the wheel. Keeping your physicians is the key to success in an APM. If your physicians are at risk of leaving, they will take the patients with them and you cannot possibly succeed or grow your APM. But they need to be part of the team. They need to be advancing your team and be, be fully uh, clinically involved in the organization. So we hope we've um, provided enough food for thought with that and we're available for any questions. Okay, great. Um, well, that was, that was that was very interesting, guys. And we do have actually a lot of questions that came in. So, uh, if you do have a question, go ahead and ask it at this time, and you can use the uh, control module at, with the question area, not the chat, 
uh, with the questions and go ahead and ask that. Any that we don't get to, uh, by the way, we're going to answer via email afterwards. So even if we're just getting to the last second, go ahead and ask it. Uh, okay, without further ado, let me jump into a couple of these questions in no particular order here. Uh, the first question being, uh, in some of MD burnout, uh, do I'm sorry, is some of MD burnout due to their reaction to the emerging data on social determinants of health and preventative health? And do they think that the framework that argues for improving health status, and do they think about the framework that uh, uh, argues for improving health status, delaying the need for specialty interventions? I know that was a lot. Does that make sense to you? Uh, maybe. Let me take a stab at it, and if Tom wants to add anything. Yeah. I mean, I think that we see that all of the additional work that's involved in harvesting data to help patients do better is a drain on physicians because many organizations have not developed the infrastructure to take the physician out of that, that data gathering exercise. So that's numero uno. The, there must be a data architecture and a patient care team where the physician is not responsible for doing administrative tasks. And the physician is focused on clinical tasks and looking at outcomes and, and creating pathways that are more efficient and uh, successful. That's um, extremely important. Do you want to add? Mm -hmm. Yeah, fun? I think I think that the, the social determinants of health also have to be recognized as major contributors to uh, costs and utilization, and they often need to be dealt with in order to deal with the cost and the value more in line. Uh, there's a lot of controversy around it, but you you do need, do need to know this, and I think clinicians do need to know for the patients what are the other factors that may be involved other than just uh, what we get in the lab and the mm -hmm. consultations. And, and if there is a patient care team, as Tom was talking about, that has navigators and uh, so on, on, the organization will have already started to make tracks to the community to be able to work with community organizations or um, financial services on helping patients deal with some of those social determinants. That's key. It's also not the physician's job to be able to do that. It has to be an organizational job. Yeah. That's okay. what leads to burnout. You you have expectations that are not uh, met with compensation. Yeah. And they're not doable. <laughs> not doable. But, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Great. Um, so next question is, uh, you say physicians are overwhelmed with all their responsibilities, but uh, now they have to look at data on top of it. How do you persuade them to do this? Well, that, that came back to what I was saying before. They're going to look at it and say, well, what, what the heck? It has to be fair. It has to be re un understood from above. You're not going to just layer this on. They have to be able to look at this in the context of appropriate scheduling and uh, rewards it's not we're not here to support uh unfair or improper expectations and it can't be voluminous mm -hmm. uh, to to expect physicians to dive through detailed numbers um and some of the things that i've seen shared with physicians like more financial data more um, administrative data, give them the story about their patients. I think part of the problem that we see out there is that the organizations have not been able to gather the clinical data that's needed to engage the physicians in real care improvements. They're still either working only with claims data um, or working only with very sparse kinds of post-acute kinds of services, population health, get, get patients into physicians, 
rather than real clinical solutions to problems of persistent poor control and chronic disease and um, issues like that. So one of the assumptions here in any physician engagement strategy is that the organization has developed a sufficient data structure to be able to actually move outcomes and costs in a direction. And that data has to come from, uh, and this is all in the previous webinars, has to come from not just claims data, but actual clinical data that can be harvested from the practices that are that have those patients in the APM. Great. Um, next question is, uh, if you separate the PCPs uh, 10 numbers uh, separate from the specialists, how do you capture via attrition the high risk or high capitated patients being seen and well managed by the MPs and PAs in the specialist practices? Is this possible? How do you, well, there are, okay, so I think it's a fine line when you are dealing with medical specialists. So let's, let's talk about the nuances of some of the medical specialists. There are some medical specialists who you may want to keep within the proper uh, APM. Cardiologists, um, if you're dealing with a high percentage of heart failure. But I think the proceduralist is where you, you start to really look at some of those issues. Does it make sense to have the proceduralist always in the organization? Do you need um, GI in or out of the organization? Some of that will be answered by your data mm -hmm. and what you're starting with in the patient population in terms of conditions past procedures and diagnosis. And that's important to look at before you decide that. If you are going into a high, highly specialized environment where you will be looking at extremely ill patients, you've got a different APM than you have when you're dealing with, a, with a, like say a, a generic uh, Medicare population then you've got to structure it accordingly to capture the, the core specialists that you need in there, endocrinology if you need it. Uh, but what we've seen when we actually break down the data in episodes is that it's, you don't have all of endocrinology focused on diabetes. You don't have all of cardiology focused on heart failure. So it really is a... Um, there, there's no reason why you can't manage the patient through two different TIN numbers or bifurcating the primaries and specialists because the overall cost is still the overall cost under a global population health payment process that will be attributed to the primary organization. And if you have a partner specialty arrangement, where the specialists are contributing to the redesign of care, contributing to the criteria for referral, and you have shared data, which is extremely important, shared data on outcomes and the trajectory or trend of, of patient costs and outcomes over time, then you've got a scenario that can work regardless of whether they're in the same tent or not. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, and along with that, what are the advantages and disadvantages in private equities acquisition of docs? That's an interesting question. <laughs> I think the, um, I think what we've seen as a huge advantage is the spur of innovation and in, in technology in assistance to physicians. We have seen an enormous draw of physicians to equity-backed practices. Um, many of them are concerned that it will, you know, the backing will evaporate and as soon as they don't produce the gains that, you know, the equity 
the investors will drop out. But the reality is, is that it um, spurs innovation. It provides a framework that traditional providers can look to that has been attractive to physicians. Physicians clearly want a support environment and clearly have not been getting it um, from all of the traditional organizations. And so um, the disadvantage, of course, is that you're erecting two systems of healthcare, one in which you've got medical, has a lot of things to do. Um, the traditional providers are providing medical education and research and supporting more patients who are severely ill. Uh, they have a lot of different jobs. The equity-backed are more of a concierge kind of um, operation in many cases, not necessarily attracting. I don't, I don't know. I think it'll be really interesting to take apart the numbers on patients at, at some point, which is not really out there yet, mm -hmm. to see who is in what kind of environment. Interesting. Um, okay, next question is, uh, where do you see uh, PM and R physician specialists fitting into episodic models and SNFs? Uh, I think they're critical to get, to get a, a, a lot of PM and R. Uh, myself, I think they're uh, necessary to get people mobilized and engaged. So I think that's will be part of the satisfaction, but also part of uh, quantification of, let's say, how far you can walk in, uh, in a certain period of time. The, that, that is something that they can bring to the table, and it's very helpful in conjunction with both uh, neurosurgery and orthopedics. Yeah, and I, I think that one of the things that you see in this kind of detail uh, specialty by specialty competition is that you don't see a holistic look at um, skeletal, musculoskeletal kinds of conditions that would enable you to trade off physical therapy and motion development with surgical solutions. So it, PM&R would be a fantastic way. Um, they could be like um, they could really help develop these pathways towards how you would look at patients with certain conditions. Like for example, hypermobility, um, <laughs> huge issue in the population and end up with dislocations and fractures and a variety of things. But the surgical solution or the procedural solution to those isn't always the answer. Sometimes it's the uh, it's the more holistic answer to the musculoskeletal system. That's interesting. Uh, next question, and uh, you may or may not know the answer to this, is uh, how are medical school curriculum changing to help new docs address their new role? <laughs> Tom, you probably or do. Or are they? <laughs> it's been a while. I, I, I did teach the medical school and the residencies, but I'm not I, th I do believe that they're beginning to address this, or if they've not already addressed it, uh, they have to, uh, because this is critical for the future of how healthcare is provided. And these are people that are amenable to a teaching being taught. So I think that that's critical. Um, I think it probably will go first with the residency versus uh, the students. but. I think that when the residencies, that ties in with the physicians who are teachers being, bringing that on board. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. But they really should. I guess it's got some catching up to do. Um, next question is, uh, are you finding the expectations of physicians are different for younger physicians versus older? And what about expectations of female versus male? Susie, you want to go? <laughs> um, my wife is a, 
physician. She's sitting here and she's a academic, former academic. Uh, and uh, I would say that the expectations, no, I, I don't know that they have different expectations, but I do think that the, what happens is that the younger ones may not have as much uh, experience or as much clout. I can see organizations taking advantage uh, of putting some of these folks in leadership roles that just don't have the connections. It has to be a fair, fair fight. You know, <laughs> you have to have people who have experience in all these different things and not just a matter of trying to get pushed an agenda through. It has to take in different opinions and different perspectives. Mm -hmm. I, I have seen some data out there that is pretty clear that the younger physicians are a lot more interested in employment and work-life balance and um, more actively engaged in technology. You know, the, the typical kind of age things that we see across all circumstances is hitting healthcare too. Um, but also a lot of issue, gender issues that still remain um, as not just uh, in practicing physicians, but in medical researching physicians as well, where women physicians are not well supported in that environment, workload schedules, et cetera, et cetera. So you see a lot of that come out and whoever figures out how to how to work through those kinds of issues. And we're all working through generational issues right now, but it's... <laughs> Whether we like it or not, yeah, huh? We'll have a really good key to how to develop a future. And since the majority of medical students are women right now, key to answering those issues and, and needs of women physicians is going to be really important. We, uh, we had actually a statement come in here that uh, had to do with what you said earlier. It says, my, my last wellness visit under my MA plan was with a resident and a medical student. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, we have time for one last question here. And we're going to have to close it out. But uh, and, and actually, this is a great one to end with. It says, successful ACOs have been doing your strategies worth considering for years. And we're looking for new ideas and strategies. What new innovative strategies do you recommend? Uh, I recommend they start using clinical data. So I think it's true. They've done a lot of look at data, say that most of them have worked heavily on population health and care coordination. They have added more of an infrastructure to support the physicians. They've made great gains in these kinds of things, but what we see most ACOs unable to do is to help physicians improve actual patient outcomes, especially related to persistently poor controlled patients and chronic illness, because they're not equipped to use the clinical data. And so clinical interventions and targeting interventions and using clinicians to develop pathways that use targeted interventions is uh, something that we think is key to existing successful ACOs. I think, okay. oh, go ahead. Yeah, the other thing this dovetails with what Terry is saying is looking at the use and, and interpretation of interventions. Uh, it's, this is not a passive pro or static process. Uh, you want to see whether certain actions do have an impact and that is going to be critical for the organization to be able to share that internally or externally so that uh, you can move things forward. Right. I mean, one of the um, examples that we see when we, when we build out our episodes of care, for example, which show a diabetes episode of care will show a, a variety of different things. But at the core of it is a, a population of patients with, if you look at their outcomes, their hemoglobin A1C, obesity levels, 
blood pressure, a variety of outcomes over time are absolutely unchanging. And yet, when you dig into those patients and look at what medications they're on, they're on straight insulin. Now, is the straight insulin a financial issue? If it is, then the organization needs to address the financial issues. But I mean, of course, that is involved in having that substrate of SDOH data and working, why is it that the, clini the clinical status of that patient is unchanging over time and bringing it to the attention of the clinician in that world. Um, some of the clinicians have responded with, well, my patients aren't gonna do that. Well, that's, you know, that that's kind of like an end. You can't do anything with that. <laughs> you have to look at having the organization support various solutions to make it possible for the patient actually to do it. That means that you do need to engage navigators to help kind of break down the barriers of the patient willingness or ability to proceed with various treatment changes and so on. A referral to specialists. We see persistently poor control patients with no referrals ever to a specialist. Well, that, that yet, these conditions that fail to change over a number of years. So there's um, a lot of room clinically for physicians to engage in those strategies and to leave the, uh, let's, let's not address just who showed up in the emergency room, but who has an exacerbation which is uncontrolled the patient is uncontrolled and they're st still on the same kind of trajectory as they were two years ago. And this, this brings up therapeutic inertia, which is a key problem uh, in the ambulatory setting because things just keep on keeping on and they don't improve or they're not looked at seriously. Yeah, there's a lot there. Yes, unfortunately, we, uh, we have to close out. We are out of time today. Um, but uh, this was a wonderful presentation and there's just so much here. And uh, I want to thank our speakers. Uh, you guys did a great job. And as we close out, I wanted to encourage you all to uh, stop by the uh, virtual exhibit booth at uh, bbcexhibithall.com. And uh, you will see what it kind of looks like here. And you, it's a great place that you can uh, read more about them and see what they're doing in the value-based care space and connect with their team. And then finally, if you would like to reach out to uh, either of our speakers today or to the ROGI team, um, then uh, please do so. Uh, Terry, if I could get you to go to that very last slide. There is, a, there we go, there, there's their contact information. Dan Cronin is uh, is in their business development department. He'd be happy to, to run you through a demo and kind of tell you a little bit more about what they do. Or feel free to reach out to me as well, and I'm happy to uh, facilitate an introduction. So, but thank you again for everybody who came. Thank you to our speakers. Hope you have a wonderful and safe rest of your days. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Totally good.